Oh, really? Yeah, oh. and uh, the fellow that put together these questions here uh, also wrote the liner notes to the album. Oh, there's liner notes for the Japan one? That's right. Well, that's, that's, that's just a, a custom here. The albums will have liner notes, and uh, they'll usually have a lyric sheet and a Japanese translation of the lyric sheet. What's the liner notes about? Uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't uh, I haven't read them, um, but the, the journalist at Rocking On Magazine is the guy who wrote them. Oh, cool. So I guess what you know what they usually do is they they base it on your bio. Um, they write about the the songs and uh, you know whatever they've been told by the record company and you know right. their, their own views and whatnot. Um, these questions might reflect what he's written. Uh -huh. Iron so maybe if we play Sherlock Holmes here, we can <laughs> sort of determine what you know what he thinks about the band. Because often uh, the questions will sort of give hints and, and, and reveal the uh, the thoughts of the journalist. Right. I, I'm, I'm just sort of the go-between. I'm I'm an I'm a interpreter, uh -huh. and uh, have been faxed this list of questions here. Uh -huh. So with that in mind, I guess I will. So are you in Japan? That's right. I'm in Tokyo. I'm, uh -huh. I'm as you can tell from the the accent. I'm, I'm American, but yeah. I've been here about 15 years here. Uh, oh, wow. So you know, my entire adult life. And cool. it, actually, you're, you're you're still very young, aren't you, Ben? It says you're 17. Yeah, I'm 17. Wow. I, I just talked to the guy in uh, Silver Chair about oh, really? two months ago, and uh, he was only like 15. Yeah. Are, are you guys uh, doing something with the kids there in Australia? What's going on? What's going on? I don't know. I don't know. It's just pretty weird. Like. <laughs> We were we were around quite a bit before Silverchair. There's not many like yeah, I don't know. It's just just weird, just a little. Well, the thing is, I mean, it doesn't really happen in the other places, you know, in like America or UK or other artists I talk to. You know, nobody is 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 under the age of, uh, you know, they're usually not under their early twenties. Um, yeah, I guess just I don't know. I guess it hasn't really happened here before either. Oh really? Okay. But it's not—it's not like a regular thing. But yeah, I don't know. It just it just happened. And where are you right now? Is it—is this your home? Uh, yeah, I'm at home. And where in Australia do you live? Sydney. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So you're born and raised in Sydney, then? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, then. Well, let me get down to the list of questions here. Um, when did you uh, first start writing songs? How old are you? Um, when I was ten years old. Uh huh. And what what kind of songs were they? And what sort of uh, instrument were you using to write them? Um, guitar. Just when I like, they were just pretty easy songs, you know. When I knew three chords, <laughs> I just wrote. Yeah, I can't even really remember. It was just bad songs, you know. Is that when you first started playing the guitar, or had you already been playing for a couple of years before? No, like as soon as I as soon as I learned a couple chords, I just wrote, started writing songs. Mm, mm. So were you, were you a serious listener of music at the time as well? Um, not really, like, I don't know, like mainly, I guess I always liked music, but I just, I don't know, I, I was never really like, when I was little, I guess I, yeah, I don't know, I liked like radio stuff, you know, like when you're just growing up, that's all you hear. Were, were your parents very musical? Were you sort of uh, inundated in, in music at home? No, we have a piano, mm -hmm. that's about it. <laughs> No one plays it or anything. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I don't know. Uh huh. Just happened like that. Uh huh. This this guy's asking here, you know, about about the the impulse to write music, like how how sometimes um, um, people start writing music as 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 an outlet, you know, for frustration or or for a feeling of, of elation or joy or, or whatever. In your case, I guess the music just came rather naturally. There wasn't any, any sort of emotion. Um. Well, I don't, I don't really remember. In the beginning, like, I just did it because that's what I thought you do, you know? You just play an instrument and you write songs. And So, so yeah, I guess that was just like... But now it's different. Now I write... Now when I write songs and, like, I play live, it's, like, the only time... I don't know, that's, like... That's just what makes me really happy, you know? Mm -hmm. and, like, that's what I've... You just know, like, when you hit on something, mm -hmm. that's, like, what you're meant to do. Like, when I'm playing live, mm -hmm. just, like, that's when I know, that's when I feel most, like, alive, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so it just, I sort of can't live without it. Like, yeah, it's pretty weird. It's, 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 it's what you get the rush from right now. Yeah, exactly. So, um, How about when you're, when you're writing? Is, is it the same feeling, or, or is writing more of a, uh, a tortuous 
process where you just kind of have to grind it out and uh, well in the beginning now it used to be really easy like I'd just have like a million ideas and I'd just write lots and lots of songs but now now it's I don't try and force it as much like I used to think if I didn't write five songs a week I was like losing my touch mm -hmm. but now like now, like, I haven't written a song for a couple of weeks just because mainly I'm missing a string on my guitar. <laughs> and I don't really think it's, like, a big deal. Like, I don't know, I'll just... I'll, I sort of... I want it to happen, like, more naturally. I'd rather have, like... Like, I'm, I've already... Like, la this in one year, I recorded two records with, like, 15, 20 songs each, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just rather make the next things I do, like, a bit more focused than... I'd rather just try and make them a bit more quality based, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, yeah. To write so many songs, though, you must be very prolific, or are you writing a lot of songs that sound like each other, or...? Uh... I don't know, they, no, now I'm, now they're, now I reckon I'm writing better songs. Mm -hmm. And, well, when you first start playing an instrument, like, the, you've got an infinite number of possibilities, and just the more you go on, you just lose some of those because you've done them enough times, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, like, I've written all the songs I can with, like, those three chords that I learned in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now I've just got to move on a bit. And yeah, so, I don't know. So it's not that I'm, like, slowing down. I'm just trying to move on a bit, you know? Yeah. Well, when artists develop, they often talk about the um, developing the courage to sort of toss songs out. You know, yeah. In the early days, I guess you sort of clutch on to anything that you're exactly. able to write, but then after a while you get to the point where you can judge things a little more rationally. Yeah, like sometimes I just think, like, people don't do that enough. Like, I'll hear a song on the radio and I just go, man, if I wrote that song, I'd just, like, leave it at the bottom of my pile, you know? Like, I'd never, like, record that. It's such a crap song. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> you, can, you, you can now immediately identify the B-sides, huh? Yeah, you just, like... I don't know, you just... You just know, you're just a bit more focused, you know, you know what you want to do, you know what you're looking for, you can tell pretty much straight away if right. you're onto something or not. Uh -huh. yeah. in, the, in the writing process, or, you know, in, in the process that involves um, creating the music, do you, do you think there's any, is there a conflict going on in you, are you trying to work, uh, are you trying to, um, how, can I, how can I phrase this? Um, is there a conflict with reality, reality first of all? I you think you're trying to come to write music to come to grips with reality? Is it your well, way? yeah, the conflict is mainly like, like, there's one song on the new Noise Addict record, and mm -hmm. there's a line in it, like, just got to concentrate on living my life and not on writing it down. Because, mm -hmm. like, sometimes, like, you just feel like the only reason you're living is so you have something to write about. Mm -hmm. And, like, it shouldn't be like that. And so it's hard. The conflict is finding the balance mm -hmm. between living and recording that life, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you go too far to one side and you just find you're just sitting at home all day writing songs or you haven't written a song in a year and mm -hmm. you just got to find that middle ground where, yeah, it's just like there's no point writing a diary all day if you don't go out and do anything to write about, you know? Oh, I see. So it's possible to fall into the habit of vicariously living life through your music. Exactly, and you just become over-analytical mm -hmm. and... Like, you're writing about things that really shouldn't even matter and mm. just don't have a life. <laughs> so you just, uh -huh. just got to find that middle ground, you know? Huh, well, maybe that's why you haven't written a song in a couple of weeks or even bothered to replace the string on your guitar there because uh, maybe you do, think it, you do think it's healthy now to kind of remove yourself. Exactly. You just got to just gotta just live a bit, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. I was, it's, it's interesting that uh, the, a band... Like Silver Chair, for example, should should play the music they do. But then again, um, grunge was there, I guess, when they first started listening to music. Uh huh. It, it, does, does this uh, category of grunge mean anything at all to you? What it really means to me is like I'm not like I like a lot of those bands that are called grunge bands. You know, like like I don't know if you want to call Nirvana that or something. Like that was like one of my first concerts I ever went to in Nirvana and uh -huh. that was like that just blew me away and was a big inspiration on me and but mainly the thing it means to me is that like my generation has grown up with so called like independent or alternative bands as rock stars mm -hmm. like mainly the generation before it was all underground now it's not underground 
mm-hmm. and I don't know. I just think that's a really weird thing that like something so sort of subversive mm-hmm. and anti-establishment is so much part of the establishment. Mm-hmm. That's all I really think about. <laughs> that. Like I don't know. I just think I just think each band like separately. Like I don't, I don't that sort of genre doesn't really mean anything to me. Like I don't strongly identify with. I see. Flannel shirts and not washing or anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, th- there is, um, by definition, a sort of um, pursuit of loudness in that kind of music. Yeah. And you know, that's obviously that that that's a part of you. But at the same time, I guess you would be more what we call lo-fi. Yeah, maybe. And the, the journalist here notes that lo-fi. Um, it's used loudness in favor of um, concentration on the the song, you know, the the, yeah. pu- the the purity of the song. I don't know. Well, I think like a lot of the times, what people call lo-fi is just people that don't have much money to spend on their recordings. Like, <laughs> like I couldn't really believe it. Like when I was in America making that wait, making I don't know. I was doing something, and like I went on this like. Um, TV show mm-hmm. and they were saying how they had this special on lo-fi the week before mm-hmm. and someone like brought out the noise addict young and jaded record and goes this is like the perfect example and all this mm-hmm. and like we didn't like set out to do anything like we just I just recorded it on my tape recorder that's all it was it's mainly <laughs> like and I was speaking to you know Lou Barlow from Sebado right. I was talking to him about it like about lo-fi and like when I sit down when like people sit down at their four track recorder you're trying to make it sound as good as possible. <laughs> it just so happens that it doesn't have the means to make it sound like a Michael Jackson record. <laughs> but if you could, you would, you know? <laughs> and, like, right. uh, I don't think it's weird. Like, it's more like a... I think it's more like a journalist thing, like lo-fi. I don't think... I think there's not really many bands that sit down and say we're going to be a lo-fi band. Mm-hmm. It's just, just resources. Right, right. Yeah. But then again, a, a Sebado, you know, does have the financial means to make it sound like a Michael Jackson record. Yeah, I guess. Or, 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 like or, or, or at least they can borrow enough money for the time being to make yeah, it yeah. sound like that. But still, it's it's, it's a very it's very stripped down, raw, yeah. unadorned. You know, very few overdubs, etc. Oh, well, you know, like when I listen to their record, like I wouldn't really call that a lo-fi record. Like it's pretty big sounding, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, 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 they even have strings on, on, the, on, the, on the last one. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know. Okay. Sort of like, uh, you know, a part of the imagination of rock journalists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good enough. So we'll, we'll toss out the term lo-fi for now. <laughs> um, how about, um, okay, this is going to overlap with what we were talking about before, but since, since the question is here, I must ask it. Um, what, 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 what artists uh, do you think comprise the backbone of, of your sound? Mm. Well, like, like, I don't know. Like, as far as, I haven't really, Noise Addict, with the Noise Addict, new Noise Addict record, like, we recorded that in um, last June or something. Mm-hmm. And, like, I haven't really written, like, a rock song since then because we're not going to record another record. And so... I've mainly been writing my own stuff, so... But with the rock stuff, it was just... I don't know, it was just all... That sort of... It was just rock, you know? <laughs> like, it didn't really have any... It's just everything and nothing were influences on that. It just... That was just getting together and being a loud band and having songs and stuff. But mm-hmm. my acoustic stuff, like... I'd say, like, a lot of, like, folk and country people, like, Loud and Wainwright and... Um, uh, I don't know... I'd, Johnny Cash and mm-hmm. a whole bunch of people like really influenced me with that because it's like power through acoustic music, you know. Mm-hmm, right, right. But and Jonathan Richman and I don't know. There's a lot of people. I, mm-hmm. I used to think about that a lot. Like, oh man, this, this song sounds like someone or whatever. But now, no, I sort of no, I'm a bit more confident like of writing songs. I just yeah, it's. Just, I don't know. Yeah. Well, so the the, the 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 quick answer is the these songs are me. There's no other artists. Uh, yeah, of, yeah. Of <laughs> like mainly those kind of influences come like in your like whatever formative years when you're like listening to lots of records and like before you start writing songs. So it would have probably been like I don't know, like all those radio songs like Tiffany and 
bad disco stuff. I hate disco stuff. Mm-hmm. But after that, you, I reckon you sort of like already like you're you've already like developed and you like you can't really help what comes out of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah, someone said to me the other day, like I was just at home playing a whole bunch of like hip hop records and like funk records and. Mm-hmm. They go, it's so weird, like, you like all this stuff, and, um, but you write this, like, just mellow acoustic music. Mm-hmm. And I just said, like, I can't really help, like, what I write, you know? Right, right. I doubt I could really write a very good hip-hop record, because it's not, it's just not my soul, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I don't know. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, there was a very f- famous uh, quote by Frank Zappa, who, you know, when an, in- when an interviewer showed surprise that, he listened to like classical music and, and other kinds of music. You know, yeah. Zappa came back with, well, "What? When, when you eat, do you eat nothing but fried chicken?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, people people like different things. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now the the uh, interviewer here uh, talks about um, artists like uh, like a Bob Dylan or a Bruce Springsteen, the artists who sort of um, deliver their own perspective on, uh-huh. on 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 changing times, on confused times. Um, there's, there's sort of a tradition of, of this. Um, what do you think of artists like that? Uh, maybe he sees something in common. Uh, I don't know. I don't really it. listen to uh-huh. that kind of stuff. I got like a couple mm-hmm. records, but mainly like it's m- way more like personal for me. You know, like I'd rather. I think you get like a bit. There's like a danger of being like. Like. I don't know, like, you're saying something and people expect it's meant to, like, speak for them also. Oh, I like, see. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just wrote, like, what I see, like, and I write about things that, like, just worry me or whatever, and I don't know, like, I don't do big social commentaries or whatever. The, 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 the idea of being a voice of a, gener- voice of a generation doesn't appeal to you, huh? Well, it can, it can happen, like, on a personal level. Like, if you look at that whole thing with Kurt Cobain, like, he was just writing, like, about his own problems, but so many people identified with it. But as far as writing, like, political songs or, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. The guy also mentions here, like, uh, th- there are artists like, like a Beck or a Liz Fair. Uh-huh. Um, um, first of all, do they, do they appeal to you as just a listener? Yeah, I like those guys, and I think, like, that's far more, like, I guess, in a way, though, that's like the 90s version of Bob Dylan or Bruce Springsteen, you mm. know? Or yeah. like Joni Mitchell or something like that, because... It's like more the n- 90s, like, politics is personal, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of like... In a way, like, I can see, like, how a Liz Fair record is, like, far more political than a... Like a Bob Dylan record or something like that. In, because in, in what way? How... how, how wh- just because, like, things she challenges personally... Mm-hmm do represent a lot in our society, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I guess in a way it's just less straightforward. It's far more subtle in the way that, like, it comments on our times. Mm-hmm. But I don't think, like, she'd be, like, want to be labelled, like, a spokesperson for females or something. So. Oh, so, the, uh-huh, but, she's, but she's still making a, sta- a valid statement nonetheless. Yeah, it just happens like that. But people, I think, nowadays don't really go out of their way to try and speak for their peers. Mm-hmm. Well, Beck was saying something to the effect of, uh, you know, his the aim of his music is to sort of put a twist on reality, you know, present it in a slightly, slightly skewed, slightly yeah. strange way. Um, your sound as well, to bu- to use the words of the interviewer, is sort of like an alternative blues, um, which might also sh- share something in common with that. Yeah, maybe. I think I think more like I'm still like sort of. I don't know. I think like the thing I've always admired about Beck is that he just does like whatever the fuck he wants. You know, mm-hmm. like you listen to his records and there's just it's just insane because he just he doesn't care sort of. Or from what I see, like he doesn't care like about what anyone thinks. He just does what feels right. Where like I think what I do, it's not like it's not a really good thing. Like it's a lot more self conscious. You know, mm-hmm. right. and like. I don't really like that, like, about how I write. I can't help it. Like, I just... Because it's, you know, it's just a scary thing, like, to have courage like Beck does or something like that, to just do whatever. Mm -hmm. But, and I think, like... But those sort of things, like, develop. Like, he's just been playing forever, so... 
maybe you want to be a little more focused, though. I just want to be. I just want to have a bit more, just courage to just, you know, try different things. And it happens slowly, but it just happens over time. Mm, mm. Yeah. Now, I guess you guys were on the the Grand Royal label. Yeah. And which was sort of the house that the Beastie Boys built. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Is that a, the Beastie Boys? Are they an act that uh, you've you've always enjoyed, or? Yeah, know? like I, you know, they're a hard band not to like. Uh huh. But um. Um, I like not really musically, like you know, but I mean, like they're not like an influence, like on me musically. But as far as like, yeah, they're like one of my favorite bands. And so it's it, a really cool thing. It must have been quite an honor to 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 get onto that label. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Like that, they've got a pretty like mixed, you know, mixed um, uh, like label, whatever agenda or something like that all those bands are so different on that label but that's what's really cool I think mm -hmm. and like yeah it's, it's just like they're like one label that's never gonna be like typecast you know like it's not like you'll say you're on Grand Royal and mm -hmm. people will assume you're like a sort of one sort of band or another because there's like us and then Luscious Jackson then DFL and the Moist Boys and Beasties and everything's so different you know mm -hmm. so that's really cool mm -hmm. It's a song about, um, I mean, a song, it's a question about, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, your your lyrical content. Uh-huh. Um, there's often uh, this, this theme that, that pops up in other people's lyrics about how, uh, you know, the, 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 the singer of the song, the, the, the central fig the figure, he's talking to somebody else about how, you know, you don't understand me or you've never, you've never made any efforts at understanding who I am or what I am. In your case, it seems to be, um, it seems to start out with the assumption that people are not going to understand you anyway. Sure. Is that, does that make any sense at all to you, that assumption? Yeah, in a way it does. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, like I've never really like heard anyone say that, but like now I do, like I can see where they sort of get that from. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just part of that whole like just being a self-conscious thing, like I'm not I don't know. I, yeah, I can't really say. Like, but I can't think of it. I can't articulate what I'm thinking here. Yeah, well, may, maybe the this would be my take on it. I think when he, when he talks about an artist, you know, complaining about somebody not understanding him, maybe that artist is taking himself too seriously. Whereas yeah. maybe the person who assumes he's not going to be understood anyway um, has the upper hand because he's not. That person is not necessarily taking himself seriously. But he yeah, well, I guess there's a certain element of that that, like, that, like, I just, it's just pop music, you know? Like, I realize that. Mm -hmm. And that I'm not about to, like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this this idea of miscommunication is not, is just not maybe... Well, not I'm having a big trouble with miscommunication right now, actually. <laughs> 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 so you can see it's very prominent in this life. But does the theme ever crop up in your in your lyrics at all? Um, Miscommunication. Well, I just think the inability to communicate properly is like a big theme in like overall. Just just not being able to. But often it's like an inability to like communicate with myself. You know mm -hmm. about how like I don't really know what I want or why I want the things I want, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's just that confusion basically. Uh-huh. Here's a, a, a specific example yeah. of one of your songs. Like I said, there's a song called Love Song. Yeah. And this guy sees it as a very new approach to, to a, a new concept of, of a love song. I guess you, you talk about how uh, uh, boys around the world are all writing a song uh, to, yeah. to the same to the same girl, to the one to one girl, or... Well, just every, it was, the lyric is every boy in the world writes a song for a girl for every girl in the world. Oh, I see, huh? Yeah. And he, he, he really likes that phrase. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I wonder what it is that, uh, that that makes this seem like a new kind of love song to him. I don't know. Like, well, the idea for that song came from reading this interview with um Tom Morgan from Smudge, and he was talking about how, like, he's just, like, so... He's so embarrassed about his songs that 
he just writes really dumb songs. Not dumb, but like just about silly things and like joke sort of songs because he's too scared to like put his real feelings into songs. Mm -hmm. And that was like how that song started, like about, you know, can't get it happening to write a love song. I always bring in rock and roll. I always bring in dumb stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I just thought like, it's sort of like even a love song Mm -hmm. doesn't really have to be, it doesn't really express that much about you because everyone in the world does it. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's sort of like such a cliche, you know? Right. I don't know, I don't even know what I really meant. Like, it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I sort of like, I just make up things, like, when I talk to people about it. You know? <laughs> like, I do mean it, but I sort of just don't know if I really meant it at the time. Uh-huh. The things only make sense to you later. Right, right. But maybe when you try to write about a certain subject matter... Um, you feel like um, it, it, it might sound a bit too stodgy or a bit too serious, so you maybe you write something uh, yeah. a little more novel. Well, it's just it's true. Like just it was just like a statement. I don't think I really actually meant anything by it. It's just every boy in the world writes a song for a girl. Mm-hmm. It just that doesn't have to mean a song. It's just everyone is sort of like helpless in the end, you know. Mm-hmm. Here's a question where I think we step off the deep end. <laughs> it's kind of a a conceptual uh, question on uh, how how can that be? Yeah, it has seems to feature a lot of different metaphors, contain uh-huh. a lot of different metaphors, and this guy is reminded of Douglas Copeland. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the the author, Generation X guy. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and he seems to be reminded of this 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 concept that. Um, people of that generation um, sort of given up the idea of um, let me see what's the question here yeah I know what you're thinking I know what he's saying already like there's like because when I think about you know how there's there's this huge trend now people calling things like grunge authors and that mm-hmm. like and like I was reading one of those books I think it was that you know that bong water book right and like I was reading through it and it was just like there was no, like, beauty in the language. Mm. It was so... It was like telling a story to a five-year-old. There was... That's all it is. And, like, it was just so cynical and jaded. It was just the facts, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, that's, like, what... And, like, it makes me so sad. That's what this generation's meant to be about. There's no, like, beauty in life. There's no... Like, no one... I don't know. No one really wants to, like... Just There's no, like, beauty in the language. There's no... There's no nothing. There's just nothing. And so, like, mm-hmm. yeah, I sort of see that. Like, it's like, I guess it's trying to, dif- I guess it's kind of different, like, to the whole, like, Generation X slacker thing. But that just really bums me out because it's just, that's not how I am and that's not how my friends are. And, mm-hmm. like, yeah. At the same time, I guess maybe the, the flip side of that coin is that maybe there is this sort of overwhelming feeling of cynicism, yeah. but the the aesthetic side to that is people sort of try to give that cynicism form in their art, and they try, try to make that cynicism into something valid or even something um, that can be appreciated. Yeah, but that's like what we were talking about before with like people who just sit at home all day doing nothing, trying to write about life. There's uh-huh. nothing to write about. They're uh-huh. not real experiences, you know? Like, yeah. Uh-huh. But uh, I, I guess the uh, what he's trying to get out here is uh, is something that uh, you consciously get away, try to get away from. Like the cynicism? And yeah, you want Yeah, to. like, my songs are just about, like, they're just, like, diving into life. Like, like I'm really, like, a big fan of, you know, John Keats, the poet, mm-hmm. and all that kind of, like, romantic stuff. Because it's just about, like, just about living and like just like taking ups and downs with life and just learning from them and like nowhere in my like you know there's one song called Frigid on the record Mm -hmm. about like how like I just got really fucked up by this person and I just I don't regret it because like there's just like experience is valuable for its own sake and that's what my songs are about they're Mm -hmm. just about living and just yeah, just trying to get as much milking life for what you can get out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that may be bad or good, but just taking it. Mm. On the song My Guitar, you talk about um, rock and roll as a, as a sort of release, I guess. 
Yeah. And uh, w what about rock and roll leads you to feel that way? What, what, uh, yeah, I can't really, like, explain. Like, that's what I was saying before. Like, I just know that it just feels right for me. Like, a lot of the time I think I'm really happy, and then, but then when I get up and I play, I, like, it's just above, like, way beyond any other kind of happiness I feel in my life. Like, it's just so cleansing, and especially when I play acoustically, like, I just feel like it's just, like, so cleansing, like, spiritually, and it's just just the most beautiful thing and that's just what I love about it to mm. like just pour like all yourself into it and mm. sometimes you get nothing back but for me like it's worth it anyway it's, it's, so it's, it's not necessarily rock and roll but just the music yeah well for me like it's rock and roll or whatever, but mm -hmm. it, I can see it happening for any kind of music or art or anything you know mm -hmm. and you're just so on the edge when you're up there you're just you know you don't know how people are going to respond to it but you just do it anyway. It's such a scary thing, but it's great. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, let's see here. We've got three more questions left. Um, which to go from? Uh, okay, you're... Among musicians right now, you... You, are, I, you, know, you, guys, you would be the youngest... Maybe. Basically, as we talked about Except before. Except Silverchair. Pardon me? Except Silverchair. <laughs> You've got a couple of years on them. Yeah. Which would make you, I guess, early 20s. You'll be in your early 20s at the turn of the century. Uh-huh. Um, do you think there's anything uh, about your situation generally, generally, generationally that makes you fortunate or, or unfortunate just by, 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 by dint of the fact that you are the age you are? Um, yeah, I do. I think, I don't know, I think, like, there's a lot of, like, I'm very naive about a lot of things, which has led me to be sort of, like, I guess just foolhardy, you know? But, like, I've done a lot of things that maybe in five years I won't have the guts to do that have benefited me, just because, just out of... The, stupidity basically you know so like I've just jumped into things that perhaps I shouldn't have but mm -hmm. that have benefited me in the long run mm -hmm. and so that's like that's just what's good about being young you don't think twice about things mm -hmm. but on the bad side like I, I don't know like it's sort of like like I've sort of seen like too much for my age in a way like mm. I feel like I've I just feel like like I've lived like a million lives already, you know? <laughs> like, I really like, that's why like I love like, I don't know, like, I just feel like I have trouble like relating to a lot of people mm. who, my age, who are very like, like it's not like I've been like a junkie on the street or anything, but you know, I've like, I've toured around the world and I've met lots of different people and I've just like seen a lot and Sometimes I just worry about being, like, jaded when I grow up, you mm, know? Mm. But uh, you just have to wait and see, hopefully. <laughs> how, about, how about in terms of, like, the, the, the age you're living in? Do you think it would it, it's different for you now than it would have been to, say, for a 17-year-old musician 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Well, you know, like I said, like, I don't really like... There's, like, cynicism and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, like, boredom with life. Like, I don't really like it, but... On the other hand, maybe that, like, sparked what I do, you know? Uh -huh. Maybe maybe subconsciously, like, what I'm doing is, like, a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I have such a, like, enthusiasm about just everything is because of the age I'm living in. So mm -hmm. you can't really tell, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, actually, you know, that, that might be something you share in common with a lot of people your age. I think that the cynicism thing may have been blown out of proportion. Yeah, I think, like, I've read, like, stuff with, like, Beck, where he was saying, like, you know, people call me a slacker, but, I mean, I work, like, I go into the studio, I work 13 hours a day, or something. <laughs> and, like, I work harder than a lot of, like, you know, office executives and that. I think, like, I think a lot of people take too much on appearance, mm -hmm. you know? And, like, if you look at the real facts about a lot of these people that are meant to be you know, leaders of the Generation X, uh -huh. it's, it'd just be crap. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Um, noise addict. Uh, you guys are going to have a new release, I guess, in '96 as well. I mean, it's going to be an album released in '96. Uh, you maybe yeah, '96 in Japan, I think, and we're coming soon. I see. This, I think he means uh, the, the follow-up to the one that's already over here now. Um, I don't know what's there. Like, I don't. What, what, what was the last one released? Uh, the last album. What was the last album you made? Let's we haven't really made a full album before. We've had EPs and stuff, but maybe there's a single out or something. Oh, I see. Okay, so we, I think what he means is uh, the, the, the full album. The full yeah. album will be okay. Coming. So yeah. the full album it will probably be out '96, and we're coming in the end of January uh -huh. to play three shows. Uh huh. And what What is the al album going to look like? You think? I mean, how, how does it compare to the the EPs thus far? Um. Well, I don't know. The only thing I can really compare it to is my solo album, mm -hmm. and I think like it's very different to that like it's sort of got the same vibe off it but it's different like I think if people really like my record for what it is not for the hype or whatever like stars endorsed it then they'll also like the Noise Addict record because it's got the same like feeling in it mm -hmm. but it's it's a rock record you know it's like full band fast kind of punk pop songs and mm -hmm. I think people will dig it you know mm -hmm. Um, and lastly, uh, you guys will be opening for the Beastie Boys in 96? Yeah, and we're doing two other shows also. What, what are those? I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I, we haven't got, like, the itinerary yet. Uh -huh. well, what about your live performance? What's that going to be like? Well, I'll tell you the truth, we haven't actually started practicing yet since we made the record. Mm -hmm. So, I can't tell you, but judging by past, like, experiences with what we... We got a new guitarist, firstly. Mm-hmm. And, like, so it's going to be very different. But in the past, basically, noise egg shows have been amazing or just shocking. <laughs> so, uh -huh. But hopefully, we'll, by the time we come to Japan, we'll have been on tour for a month. Mm -hmm. So we'll be pretty tight and tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I talked to Luscious Jackson last month, you know, they yeah. came here. Um, they, you know, they, they had been touring with the Beastie Boys, I think, throughout Europe. Yeah. And they said rather euphemistically that it's a somewhat challenging um, slot because Beastie fans don't uh, are, not, are, not, are not the most patient people in the world yeah yeah I don't know we're only doing one show with them basically oh they're right so like you know, I think it'll just be mainly a fun thing for us <laughs> to do to play with them uh -huh. but I don't know like what are the crowds like in Japan like with that well, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be as bad as they were in, in Europe, maybe. This, you know, the BCs often attract a sort of um, rowdy element. In and Japan, too? It, it might, you know, maybe, but I, I would say even if they're rowdy, the Japanese don't tend to be as rude as, as Europeans might. Yeah. And I think that they're, you know, a little bit more open um, to, to, to others as well. You know, That's okay, we're pretty rowdy live. <laughs> So we should fit in. <laughs> you, can, you can satisfy their their, their rowdiness and yeah, the next there. We'll, we'll meet them inch for inch. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay, well, Ben, I think I got I got what I need to to get here. Okay. Um, and I thank you very much, and once again, apologize for the uh, the late start. That's cool. And uh, maybe we'll uh, catch up with you uh, when you get here. Yeah, I'll see you in January then. Okay, and remember, this is this was for Rocking On Magazine, and again, Rocking I'm on. Steve Harris. Okay, cool. Okay, well, nice talking to you, Ben. Yeah, you too. Okay. See ya. Bye.